Okay, so uh, today um, uh, we'll talk about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in, uh, in, in California, which is only a segment, of course, of his uh, large uh, oeuvre, but uh, an important one, and uh, I would say uh, a very interesting one. We begin with the Sturgis house, um, and we'll see most of his works done in, in, in California. Uh, I think uh, his, uh, his works in California are, are different from the works uh, done elsewhere. Uh, and uh, sometimes because of the, of the dramatic uh, landscape like here, uh, the drama, the architectural drama is, uh, is enhanced. So this is called the Sturgis House, Sturgis House. And uh, I, I think it is, uh, is, uh, is an excellent example of uh, the, the incredible vitality of this architect. Sturgis House, Frank Lloyd Wright. He collaborated uh, not for this project, or I don't know, for other projects, for the textile houses, he collaborated with his son, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., or uh, Lloyd Wright, as he's called. Uh, and um, anyway, you look at the building and you look at the car, and uh, well, that looks like a Volkswagen uh, Beetle, no? But uh, which is kind of eternal, so to speak, in, in terms of design, but the building is much more, uh, you know, uh, forward looking in a way than, than the car, than an, a car from, from, I don't know, uh, 60 years ago, 80 years ago, or whatever. The only thing uh, that um, differentiates uh, our uh, forward looking uh, architecture from the first, uh, from the 21st century, and the building, this building by Frank Lloyd Wright is this uh, uh, belonging to the earth because the building, even if it is uh, dramatically emerging from the earth, it's still emerging from the earth and is done with organic materials. As you can see, brick, wood, and such a building wouldn't be built these days uh, very often. But in my opinion, is one of his best buildings. And he built many, as you know, he built more than 500 projects and he did more than 1,000 projects. Sturgis House, California. <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright. Holy Hawk. This is a building uh, much uh, bigger and uh, with a different kind of monumentality, with a different landscape. Uh, here he used, uh, he, he did this, he, Frank Lloyd Wright was reluctant to use a lot of concrete. He didn't like concrete, but he built four textile houses where he used a, a module, uh, you know, a concrete block that he designed, which was um, also ornamental, like we see here. So he created uh, his, uh, uh, you know, uh, original uh, way of building in concrete. Of course, he designed everything. He designed furniture, he designed, uh, uh, stained glass windows, he, he designed base reliefs, uh, you see here, he is everywhere. He designed, I mean, look at those chairs, you know, they are, they are, you know, uh, dramatic, they are sculptural and they are probably very uncomfortable because he himself said that, uh, uh, you know, he suffered, uh, I mean, his body suffered, uh, a certain part of his body suffered because he said, for too long on his own chairs, meaning the chairs he designed.
I, I mean, look at this window here. You, you know, why didn't he leave it blank, you know, like this? I mean, who would do something like this these days? Nobody. And I wonder why, why the difference? Why did he need this design on the glass as opposed to us? Because we don't have similar um, uh, desires. The backs of, uh, of his chairs are rather, you know, austere. They are severe. They are, you know, you could say that it's a touch of uh, sadistic um, impulses here. You know, it's, it's not to feel too cozy or too comfortable sitting on these chairs. So again, Frank Lloyd Wright in California. Here it is. The rhythm of ornaments, the rhythmicity of ornaments. Frank Lloyd Wright. Who taught this man architecture? Because he only studied for less than two semesters in a technical school, kind of an engineering or drafting for, the, for engineering. Who taught Frank Lloyd Wright architecture? It seems God taught him, you know, and nobody else. It came from God. He was born an architect. What can you do? Also, we see here interior architecture, right? I mean, I would not imagine Frank Lloyd Wright allowing somebody else to design the interiors of his buildings. In fact, just like Le Corbusier, he promoted the idea that you start a building from the inside out, you start from the interior. So of course then, you know, since your building starts from the inside, why would you need an interior designer to design the interior? It would have been totally unacceptable to Frank Lloyd Wright. And not only unacceptable, inconceivable. A dramatic uh, big house. Now, of course, this house is not for everybody. It's not for a, for a proletarian, no. He saw that concrete is a conglomerate. And, and thus, he didn't have the highest uh, affection for concrete. But you see, he, he used it here where this quality of being, a, or this attribute of being a conglomerate is kind of um, uh, showing through. Now, I don't know who these people are here. I don't see Frank Lloyd Wright. He loved nature, as you, as you know. In fact, he loved nature so much that when he was over 85, when he was um, uh, interviewed by um, Mr. Wallace on TV in the United States, uh, Wallace asked, asked uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, do you believe in God? 
And Frank Lloyd Wright said, I do, but I spell it nature. And, uh, you know, coupled with his, uh, you know, immense affection for the Japanese uh, culture. Uh, and uh, we know in Japan also the relationship with nature is very, uh, you know, delicate and subtle and, and, and uh, I, I almost said total. Uh, what I wanted to say is that Frank Roy Wright actually, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if he advised his son Lloyd Wright to study horticulture, but that's what Lloyd uh, Wright did. He studied horticulture, although he became an architect and he built a few interesting buildings, but he also designed important landscapes for uh, his father, for the textile houses. And he was in charge. I don't know if I have on this presentation, the textile houses of Frank Lloyd Wright. I hope I do, uh, but Lloyd Wright, I have another presentation, another PowerPoint presentation about textile houses. Maybe later, if, if they are not here, I could make that presentation as well. And there I can show the works of his son, Lloyd Wright, from his first marriage, uh, he did the landscape design. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright loved uh, organic materials. Uh, this could explain why he was not totally convinced about the conglomerate of concrete or the conglomerate concrete was. But he did use concrete sometimes, maybe a little bit reluctantly, I don't know. As in all houses by Frank Lloyd Wright, the fireplace is the central piece. It's where architecture springs from, thus pleasing Gottfried Semper as well. Is this house a temple of domesticity? Maybe to an extent. Maybe, maybe for this house, because I know his son, Lloyd Wright, uh, cooperated with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright on his projects, or at least on some of his projects in California. When his father was in Tokyo building the Imperial Hotel, he uh, employed the services of his son or the collaboration of his son, Lloyd Wright, who remained in charge with some of his works in California. So maybe he did the landscape for this house as well. I'm talking about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. or Lloyd Wright. Shown here is Alin Bernstahl herself lounging on the grounds of the Hollyhock house. Now, I don't know who Alin Bernstahl, probably an actress or the, the, Maybe she was, I don't know who she was. Maybe she was an actress, maybe not, but she was probably, uh, you know, the, the owner no, of this house, Holy, Holy Hawk House. But I, I'm thinking now, uh, maybe a little bit maliciously, uh, uh, about what uh, Rem Kolka said, that even in a, in a opulent, uh, unbelievable uh, building or house, one can get uh, troubled and uh, anxious and, you know, one could have fights with someone else. So, you know, great architecture doesn't guarantee by necessity uh, psychological uh, well-being. Uh, people kill each other even in uh, great uh, buildings, no? Um, and it seems that uh, the opulence of the, uh, the architectural surroundings of Vladimir Putin doesn't uh, make him uh, 
uh, you know, stop the war. But this is a great house, uh, maybe a little bit too great in the sense that the level of domesticity is rather subdued in favor of the monumental architecture. As I said, he designed everything. And as you can see, ornament is present. Could we say that Frank Lloyd White was not a modern architect? He was. Then why did he use ornament? Because some of the best modern architects used it, including Adolf Loos, when he used a very ornamental marble, and Miss van der Rohe. And as an example, the Barcelona Pavilion. It's interesting, the plan of the house, you know, with its betrayed symmetry. The Holy Hawk house, if we had to call it a house. Again, you know, glass with a graphic uh, treatment, something we totally do not do these days. What could have been the discomfort apparently Frank Lloyd Wright had with the, you know, total transparency? Maybe, maybe the intuition of uh, Jean Nouvel was correct. Total transparency or absolute transparency, he said, uh, is obscene. I don't know if, if it's really a question of obscenity, but there is a reason. There was a reason why Frank Lloyd Wright, and not only him, of course, but uh, we are talking about him now, uh, felt the need to incise something on the glass as well. He would not have been happy with uh, you know, complete uh, transparency, with bare glass. A large estate, of course. And here is uh, the, the owner of the house. Maybe a lonely human being like many of us who needed uh, the dog to comfort her that, uh, you know, communication is not totally impossible. If it's not possible between two human beings, maybe it's possible between an animal and a human being. The oil man's daughter. Ah, so this is what it is. Apparently, she, you know, uh, was the daughter of uh, someone who made money with uh, oil. 
of course, that's where the money is. Was, is, and I don't know if it will continue to be forever. Aline Barnsdorf, the oil man's daughter. Immensely rich, hiring an immensely self-confident architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, or uh, some of his collaborators sometimes call him Frank Lloyd Wrong. Again, who would do something like this today in concrete? Nobody. And I wonder why. Is it bad? I don't think it is bad. To bring uh, different sensitivity to concrete through ornament, of course, there are today buildings that in themselves are kind of ornaments, large scale ornaments, you know, through scripting and programming and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, manipulations, uh, digital manipulations. It's possible to make, you know, ornamental buildings as a whole. But this kind of uh, ornament that um, Frank Lloyd Wright used here is uh, very rarely seen, if at all. And a beautiful drawing sketch. I don't know if all these drawings were done by Frank Lloyd Wright, but you know, I imagine the initial ones were done by him. And uh, yes, the, the the talent he had for uh, drafting was uh, continues in my, continues to amaze me. But I do have this um, observation that uh, very often, if not always, he limits the sky. As you can see here, there is much more space underneath the house than above the house. And this is in contradiction with the so-called classical uh, teaching about uh, you know, how you compose something on a piece of paper. Usually you leave a little bit of more space at the top. Let's say you draw a, a vase with flowers. You leave a little bit more space at the top. But he always frames the sky very tightly. I wonder why. I know he loved the earth and he wanted his architecture to emerge from the earth. But I wonder what his relationship was with the sky. in spiritual or religious terms as well. Or could this express Heidegger's, uh, uh, you know, uh, suggestion to us to live under the sky? I don't know. And we look at these uh, vertical elements here and we wonder, you know, are they superfluous? Because they are not needed for a, you know, definite function. They have an aesthetical function. But they do seem to belong to, to the building. And yet, the functionalist would find, uh, find it uh, very difficult to, you know, explain their presence in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, functionalism in as much as the decorative uh, treatment of this column here also cannot be uh, explained uh, in, in, in the terms of uh, orthodox uh, functionalism. Is this kitchen better than the one Frank, uh, Frank Gehry uh, uh, did for himself, the first deconstructivist gesture from, um, the first acknowledged deconstructivist gesture in uh, Frank Gehry's uh, oeuvre. I don't know, but it's not worse. And it's not deconstructed, but it, it is still, it still has a certain uh, 
sculpturalism and uh, a certain level of fragmentation, which makes the space, you know, inciting, interesting, even though it is just a kitchen. As you can see, he designed everything. The, the oil man's daughter had all the money in the world and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright knew it. I only hope this lady was not alone in all this big house with her dog, it would have been very, very sad. Now, the Pilgrim Congregational Church in Redding, California, 1960-1963. So uh, he was, uh, you know, close to 90, or I think he died in 1965. Uh, so, you know, he was 90 years old, well, close to 90, Frank Lloyd Wright. I think, I don't know if I'm correct, but it's possible that it was uh, built. Uh, no, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, either it was finalized after he died or, uh, you know, very close to his uh, departing the earth that he loved so much. Uh, he, uh, I, I like this scene more than the, the finality of the building, you know, the, the building in the process of becoming. And this was a drawing, I don't think he did it, but someone in his office. So in California, 1960, 1963, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, a church. It, I don't think it was all of it built. It is a little bit uh, assertive, but we would expect this uh, from a building by Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, I mean, you look at these spikes, they, they, be, they express a longing for, a longing for God, if you want, but in a rather, you know, a little bit too assertively, I think. I don't know if that was built, actually, that part of the church. And we have ge geometry, we have some organic matter here, we see stones there in the proximity of the altar. We see his beloved uh, fireplace, and this is unusual, no? A fireplace in a church? There seems to be a fireplace. It's almost like Frank Lloyd Wright. This is very interesting, you know? But, you know, as opposed to a cathedral or a, you know, so-called normal church where the light entered from the, the Western upside at East, which was always to be at East, so the sunlight would strike, you know, the church in the morning, he placed a fireplace here, which is very interesting. There is no, uh, I don't know, in site plan, if it's oriented uh, towards east, this part of the building or not, but uh, it has no, um, you know, uh, window here. Instead, it has a fireplace. This is very interesting and very unusual, and I think it's a fireplace there. But maybe he believed in Heraclitus, who said that uh, fire was the father of all things. Interesting that he said the father, not the mother. So I do see the north is here. So east should be this way. I don't know. I'm a little bit confused here. I, I don't know very well how to relate this plan to what we saw built. Sorry.
Maybe it was not built quite like this. I don't know. I'm a little bit confused. It's possible that the previous picture shows the space here. And it should be towards the altar and it's going to the north, approximately northwest. Anyway, uh, he was a nonconformist. He wouldn't uh, accept, uh, you know, any dogma. Dr. Georgia Ablin House, 1961, Mildred Ablin and Frank Lloyd Wright, a picture. Uh, she was the client and he was the architect. Can you imagine at 90 or so, close to 90, Frank Lloyd Wright, still creative, still loving beautiful women. Now, uh, he was married uh, the third time, I think, at that time. But uh, anyway, the, um, she was married too. Now, Mildred, I imagine she was the wife of Dr. George Ablin, uh, whoever he was. I was thinking, you know, maybe maybe I am um, I am um, to be accused for this thought, but I thought like this: that the doctors, the lawyers, and the churchmen, they are immensely important, and the reason they are important is because the doctors mediate between the humans and uh, nature, you know, physiology, nature, biology then the lawyers mediate between the humans and society and the churchmen mediate between man and God. And being so that they are indeed very important, doctors, lawyers, and churchmen, my unconventional side would say that they should be paid the least. They should be, in fact, offer their services almost for free. They should have the smallest salaries in the world. So only the very good ones who have the vocation to be doctors, lawyers, and uh, churchmen to be allowed to practice their important role for human life. Unfortunately, they are paid the highest. That's why a doctor you know, uh, has the chance to commission Frank Lloyd Wright to build this large house for himself and his wife. I imagine he, he was his wife. Maybe she was his daughter. I don't know. But he was Dr. Uh, Dr. George Ablin. And uh, yes, if, if that doctor would be paid as I wish he would have been paid, he could not have afforded to commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build this house. But it's also possible that if doctors, lawyers, and churchmen were paid the smallest uh, salaries, we, we, we would have had no doctors, lawyers, and churchmen on this earth. Which, who knows? Would life... I mean, we do need them, it seems. As uh, Fernando Pessoa said, we need God and aspirins. It would be nice to, you know, uh, have no need for aspirins. But unfortunately, anyone who has a toothache knows very well how important it is to, you know, uh, counterbalance the rather disputable, uh, disputable. Uh, uh, accomplishments of God in, in, in certain fields. After all, why didn't God do something so toothaches would not be on this earth? Why? He could have avoided them, no? I mean, omnipotent as he is. How come he couldn't solve this problem? Anyway, and other problems, of course. I don't think God was a professional. I think he was an amateur. He enjoyed his work. He enjoyed giving birth to the world and giving birth to animals and plants and uh, later to humans, or was it later? But, but, 
I mean, I, I, I remember who said it? Uh, who said it that uh, the creation uh, of, of um, the creation of Eve was uh, God's uh, second uh, mistake, implying, of course, that the, the creation of Adam was the first mistake. Was it a Milchora? It's possible. Anyway, the big house with triangular uh, pieces of furniture, I mean, with pieces of furniture where the triangle is uh, a little bit too um, obviously present, I think this um, geometrization of everything is a little bit problematic, e even in the case of a genius like Frank Lloyd Wright. But the triangle is indeed a, um, you know, a geometrical figure that uh, creates uh, dynamic uh, configurations. Obviously, Frank Lloyd Wright liked diagonals as well. And that's why, you know, he liked the triangle and uh, he liked working with a 60 degrees angle. Ornament again. You know, the works in, in California by Frank Lloyd Wright are interesting. And a little bit less known, at least by me, his later works, when he was over 80, over 85, over 90, over 95, over 100, over uh, 105, I'm exaggerating. He died, I think, at 91 or 92. But somehow he continues to live. I mean, not somehow, he continues to live through his, through his works. Like, of course, is the case of uh, every major architect and not only architect, of course, painters, sculptors, composers, writers, and so on. That is their revenge on death through the creativity. Hannah House, Honeycomb House, 1936. This is earlier, Stanford, California. But even then, he was, uh, you know, uh, about 60 years old, 70 years old, almost doesn't look like it. 1909, my God, I'm going backwards in time. George Stewart House, uh, Hot Spring Road, Montecito. This is a more uh, unpredict a more predictable house. I mean, I mean, it is unpredictable in the oeuvre of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but otherwise uh, predictable. Nineteen twenty-three, Mabel and Charles and his house, Los Angeles. Wow, this is a uh, this is a uh, you know the the famous Ennis house, one of the four textile houses that he built, and um, as I mentioned earlier, he uh, created a module, uh, the, the concrete uh, uh, block or a concrete panel. And you see here the, the employment of this uh, uh, concrete uh, module that he created. The Samuel Freeman House, also one of the four uh, textile houses. He collaborated with his son. Uh, um, Lloyd Wright, Not maybe I know he collaborated for the landscape, but who knows, maybe his son, he was supervising, he was supervising the construction of these buildings while his father was in Japan um, supervising the construction of the, the Imperial Hotel, which he cared a lot about because he loved Japan. John Storer House, the third textile house, as they are called by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, with landscape probably by uh, Lloyd Wright, his son, or Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. Alice Miller House, the fourth one, and here I know for sure that the landscape was designed by Lloyd Wright, his son. 
and and the landscape uh, is at least as good as the house, if not even slightly better. I like I I, I like very much the the landscape design of the horticulturist. Well, he studied horticulture, Lloyd Wright. He didn't study architecture, but but he also built buildings, and some of them quite good. So here we have father and son, Frank Lloyd Wright and Lloyd Wright collaborating. The father doing the building, but the son also supervising the construction of the building. And I think he had a hand also, to put it this way, on the creation of these concrete blocks that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, used. And he did the landscape, yes, Lloyd Wright. Hana House. Oh, we saw already a picture of this, but uh, now we see others. Immensely prolific, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, we have to confess. I mean, you know, he continuously experimented with different materials. Here we have wood now on the elevations of the building. Personally, I would have, uh, I wouldn't have, I would, I would have been uh, uh, accepting if, uh, if, uh, well, if anyone would have asked me, and of course uh, nobody did. But I'm wondering, what if some of these pieces of furniture were not designed by him? You know, to have a touch of someone else's, uh, you know, taste. I think he had a tendency to, like, like Joseph Hoffman, to design too much, to design everything, you know, even the slippers of the, of the owner of the house. Well, the rug was not designed by him. That's a good, uh, it's a good thing, actually. I'm not sure these uh, pieces of furniture need anyone to sit on them. They, they seem to be rather self-sufficient. Honeycomb house. So we see here his love for the 60 degrees angle. And consequently for the 120 degrees angle. The hexagon, in other words. And maybe that's the, the reason it's called the honeycomb house. I'm not sure he used the octagon, and, and, and if he didn't, this would be actually worse, uh, worthy of a, uh, of a paper on the subject, you know. I have to investigate. Did he use the octagon? And if he didn't, why didn't he? Uh, maybe you know, but Leonardo da Vinci, who didn't build a building, but he had the sketches of buildings, he very often, if not always, used the octagon. But Frank Lloyd Wright uh, likes uh, liked uh, the hexagon, not the octagon. Could it be that because uh, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't admire the, the European Renaissance, or so he said? But you know, between what he said, what and what he actually uh, believed, I don't know. There might have been a distance, maybe, maybe.
the Dutch of uh, Asia. seems to be the fireplace but uh, i am not sure how it uh, how it functions and the, the inclusion of the the ornament into it is uh, is unusual but if it is the fireplace is the si sacred space in the house let's give fire what what um, a true king deserves as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Heraclitus thought that fire was the, the father of all things. Uh, he also thought that war was the father of all things, and this confuses me, but I'm sure he had in mind a different kind of war. Well, war is war, deadly, but I don't think he imagined that fire and war would, uh, would um, cooperate to create the monsters of uh, destruction that we are capable of um, you know, unleashing these days. More, more and more, I, I, I like the works in California by Frank Lloyd Wright. Maybe because I know them less. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. I know this quotation from Frank Lloyd Wright. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. How different this statement is from what uh, an important architect of today Winnie Mas, who said, who used the, uh, the words uh, to uh, outsmart nature. I mean, such words would have been inconceivable for Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, how could you outsmart nature? And you don't even have to believe in what Frank Lloyd Wright believed that, uh, you know, nature was the, the, the closest approximation of God, because that's what he meant when he said, in that interview with Wallace on TV, I do believe in God, but I spell it nature. Sydney Bassett House, Hillsborough, California, 1938. Again, the honeycomb, again, the, the hexagon. Maybe a little bit too obsessionally systematic or system, but uh, when we look at these pictures with uh, these um, opulent uh, nature, I think uh, I think he did a good job. That uh, I don't know if he anticipated this abundance of uh, nature, but uh, the dialogue between nature and the building is. Uh, almost sublime. George Sturgis House, this one we saw at the very beginning, 1939. So it was in 1939. He was between 60 and 70 years old at that time, if I calculated well. George Sturgis House. Now we see the plan and the section. It's good to see a rectangular plan after seeing the honeycomb uh, plan, the hexagonal one.
here is uh, the will of man, the, you know, the, the wall of, of, of the creation of man, the willful man anchoring the, the whole building. And it's, it's um, you know, a medieval wall. It's a sick wall. It's a very sick wall. It's here is, uh, you know, one meter and a half sick. So you have nature and you have man and you have the wall of man and then the house emerging from both. Sturgis house, brick and wood. Fringler Wright said something of, of, of this sort that, uh, you know, uh, architecture, we didn't quite use these words, but what he meant from what I read is that maybe it wouldn't be so difficult to do architecture or to do a building if there were no windows. The windows, uh, you know, um, agitated him because how do you, you know, you could have placed this window here or here or here or the lower at the lower level. So, you know, what kind of a system could you use uh, to solve this problem, the problem of windows? But he managed, he managed. Indeed, it's a, it's a, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a Volkswagen Beetle in, in good shape and still impressive. Did Hitler have a hand in the design of the Volkswagen Beetle? I remember reading something like this, if my memory is not failing me. I personally hope that he didn't because it was a good car. It was well designed. And uh, although the, that monster uh, called uh, Adolf Hitler did have sometimes uh, good taste in even in art, he loved uh, a German uh, uh, painter, an artist, uh, who was also the teacher of Paul Klee and Vasily Kandinsky, uh, Franz von Stuff, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting artist who even built a house for himself in Germany, and not the worst house ever built, especially the interior. Franz von Stuck is a is an artist worthy of being uh, studied. I discovered some prints by him uh, for a great work from the end of the 19th century, Allegorien und Emblemen, and he did uh, so many things, and uh, he, he was uh, impressive. And that, that that's what I read that Adolf Hitler. Uh, admired a lot this artist. But anyway, forget uh, forget the Volkswagen, Volkswagen the Beetle and the Franz von Stuck. The important thing is uh, now Frank Lloyd Wright in California. This but this but this this unsettles me. How could it be that someone sensitive to art, he himself wanted to become an artist provoke then, you know, such immensely tragic wars. Also Stalin, no, another monster, because I don't think I'm wrong if I call him a monster, apparently loved poetry and wrote poetry. So this is very unsettling. How come these, these, these great provokers of unimaginable pain and suffering also flirted with art, with poetry. I don't understand. I don't. In as much as I don't understand how Bush, who, you know, embraced the Pope and uh, goes to the church, could start the war in Iraq. And of course, I cannot understand how such a pious, uh, good Christian as Vladimir Putin uh, likes to portray himself uh, being, 
can wage the deadly war in Ukraine. I don't understand. Uh, by the way, a war, Frank Lloyd White was asked in the same interview with Wallace uh, about, uh, I don't know, some kind of an arming of the, the American army. Uh, and, and, and he said, he protested, he said, if you love peace, why do you accelerate, you know, and amplify the, uh, you know, the, the, the creation uh, of, of new arms and so on? Why? If you love peace. I know some people say that that's how you defend peace with more and more advanced, uh, uh, you know, arms. But that's not what Frank Lloyd Wright believed. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a complex problem. Do you defend peace by by not defending yourself, or do you defend peace defend peace by creating more and more monstrous arms of destruction? How is it? Of course, if there were no arms, we wouldn't fe fear uh, the nuclear war. But then, uh, you know, if some people arm themselves and the others want, but on the other hand, uh, the doctrine of uh, Gandhi perhaps should be considered to fight for peace peacefully, not with arms. But idealists don't quite have always the answers on this earth, it seems. Anyway, this is a great building. I, li I always liked it. It's a smaller building than the others we saw, but it, it's it's abstract, it's organic, it's assertive, it's, it belongs to the earth, but it also springs from the earth as if it wants to escape the earth, and yet it is anchored in the earth. It's, it's an excellent building. I'm not so sure about the pieces of furniture, but I'm sure they had a great uh, dinner there or uh, whatever it was. And I like the fact that I don't see the windows here. It is as if the, the, the essence of the building is beyond the windows. Somehow the windows, well, they exist, but they, they vanish somehow in the, in the scheme of things. How oh, banal the buildings are across the street compared to the one by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, of course, it's not just the building, but the landscape itself. George Sturgis House. Ah, it was for uh, for sale. Pre-auction estimate between two point five and three million dollars. Worth it. I mean, with this money, you would buy a mediocre apartment in Manhattan. I don't know why there is written Brentwood, uh, California, because Frank Lloyd Wright didn't live in California. Or maybe this is just uh, the address, the location of the house. Anyway, uh, Gatehouse, 1940. What do I see the, the, the colored stones? Very interesting works.
this is another great work by him. It's a it's a store in uh, in uh, San Francisco from 1948. Uh, he was over 70 when he designed it, and it's you know you could say uh, simplifying excessively that it's a small Guggenheim, but it's a store. It's not a museum. But with a, sp a spiral uh, ramp, and uh, there has a, I would say, an excellent uh, uh, urban facade, uh, with just an opening uh, in a massive wall without windows. We are going to see it. It's like a small museum. This uh, store. Uh, it's a gift gift store, uh, V.C. Morris gift store, 1948. So immediately after the war, or almost immediately. This is the entrance. We are going to see the, the, the whole uh, elevation of the building. I would say there are some special gifts here. You know, you usually don't describe as a gift store this kind of space and what, what these people sell here. They seem to sell artworks. But this is the this is how the so-called gift store looks like from the street. Not bad. The dignity of architecture, the heroic, hero, heroic uh, um, you know, uh, externalization of architecture on a street, maybe without much glory. But it's a it's a jewel store in a way. Uh, they don't sell jewels per se, but it's a jewels box. The gift shop, San Francisco, Frank Lloyd Wright, 1948. Not bad. Standing out, everything this man did was standing out, just as the Guggenheim in Manhattan in New York stand it out and stands out. This much smaller building also stands out. He couldn't express the, the spiral towards the outside, but uh, it's still a very convincing building. It is not betraying its interior, although an anticipation is somehow suggested through the curvature of the arch, because in plan we saw the two circles. And great uh, brickwork, he loved bricks. He said, you know, give me a brick and I will transform it in its equivalent in gold. He loved bricks, Frank Lloyd Wright. And he was not the only one, of course. Great architects love brick and with good reasons. In its modesty, brick indeed could be its equivalent in gold. Another house, 1948. For Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, 365 you know, days uh, uh, in a year were not enough. He probably designed a house uh, every day. 
Apparently, he produced the plans for the falling water, one of his most famous and celebrated uh, uh, buildings, in two hours. If, if my memory is not failing me, he received a telephone call from the client, Mr. Kaufman, who told him that he will come to see the, the architect and the plans for the house in about two hours. And at the time when he received the telephone call, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't have the drawings done. He thought about the house, but no drawings were made. So in those two hours, since the telephone call and the knocking at the door of uh, Wright's house, in those two hours, Frank Lloyd Wright produced the plans and the sections for the falling water building not working drawings, but uh, accurate enough, rigorous enough. And the final work was built on plans, on drawings done at that time. In those two hours, he produced that masterpiece that many people think the Falling Water Building is. This is also an interesting house. It's like that huge car that is uh, to be seen there in the uh, open garage, but uh, the building is, is good. Again, 1948, but no pictures. Uh, Burger House, I love the way he uses stone, uh, you know, in a almost ludic way and adventurous in terms of color as well. And look at the, those openings, you know, in the, you know, with the, you have some glass, but you also have uh, uh, ornament and, uh, you know, uh, there is, there is a creation everything, in everything, everywhere. I don't know who this person is, maybe, you know, someone uh, still uh, owning uh, the house. Um, but you can get bored in a great uh, building as well. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't build great buildings. It's just that the human nature is uh, complex and sometimes troubled. You can feel uh, the, the angst of being alive, even in the greatest building. Arthur Matthews House, 1950. 
Now look at that tree. My God, my God, is it a tree? It is a tree, but much better than the sensationalist uh, characters in uh, Steven, in a Steven Spielberg movie. Albert Pierce House, 1950. Now, really, why would one want to go to Mars? You know, not that Mars cannot be spectacular, but uh, well, there are inconvenience, inconvenience, inconveniences there, aren't there? when the earth is so magnificent and so beautiful still how is it called this house the wilbur pierce house 1950 still in uh, in california You see, the fireplace is not always, it's not in the geometrical center. In fact, you know, his buildings are organic, so they don't have an explicit geometrical center. But the fireplace is still, you know, uh, a presence in, in the plan and in the configuration of the house. Della Walker House, 1951, Stone, and the Ocean, Pacific Ocean. Again, you know, who, who taught Frank Lloyd Wright architecture? This man was clearly born to do architecture. He didn't tire of doing architecture. It was his life. Underton Court Shops, 1951. Look at this. Continuing to amaze us, 1952. Shops, I don't know what kind of shops. That's just a detail. Like here, yeah, it's more like it, you know, more like shops. But this this um, detail is um, impressive as a piece of sculpture or architectural ornament. California still, the sun, the sunlight are Californians. I mean, the sunlight is Californian. We are going to see somebody else, something else also in terms of shopping, a bigger building done by Frank Lloyd Wright in California. Carl Kunder Medical Clinic, 1955. A different kind of architecture, a clinic after all, a medical building. But interesting again here the the ornamental uh, windows that um, that that he makes. 
you know, uh, this kind of windows uh, very rarely are to be seen today, you know. He was anticipating things that uh, still don't happen, but maybe one day would happen. Continuously experimenting Frank Lloyd Wright. He was never happy with a found way. 1955, Randall Fawcett House. I mean, looking at the plan, you, you can see that, that that his way of conceiving the building was, you know, in a, in a total embrace of the landscape. That is, uh, it is outgoing, it is aspiring for the horizon, it is, um, you know, uh, in, in, in a, in a, it has the confidence of belonging to the earth. It's not a timid building. It is moving towards nature with um, open arms. It is uh, embracing the outside. An architecture of extroversion, perhaps. Maybe sometimes the ceilings in the buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright are a, a little bit low. I remember when I visited the Falling Water uh, building that I had this feeling that the living room had the ceiling a little bit low. Was it because Frank Lloyd Wright was not the tallest man on earth? Maybe this could explain a little bit, I don't know. But even here, you know, you feel, especially when the ceiling does not have a, uh, you know, uh, some kind of lighting coming, light coming from above, it could be a little bit uh, pressing, I, I would say. I mean, you know, if this is a door here, and it seems to be, you see the top part uh, is uh, rather close to the ceiling. Uh, it's not too low. I mean, you know, you look at the chairs, you know, if a chair has, uh, let's say, 45 centimeters or so, uh, so it's maybe three meters high, but for such a big space, maybe the ceiling is a little bit low. Yeah, it's better because you have the light also coming from the ceiling. We know Frank Lloyd Wright loved uh, horizontality, although he was cap very capable of uh, creating even a one mile uh, tall uh, skyscraper, which was not built but he built some tall buildings, not too many, but uh, you know, like a Johnson Wax or a Price Tower, which is an excellent, a beautiful, um, you know, uh, short, tall building, if I can say so. Uh, one of the best, uh, you know, small skyscrapers, if I am to call it so. It's not really a skyscraper, but it is a tower. Very beautifully done, priced out. Again, uh, contemplate the ornaments here on the windows.
here it is. Now this is this is the, the work I, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. 1957, the Marin County Civic Center. Uh, it's a civic center, but it has uh, various functions. It's I think it was built after he died. Or maybe the construction began in his uh, in the later part of his life and was finalized after he died. I have to double check this. These fires that he uses sometimes are a little bit. Um, I mean, I know. He, I mean, I imagine he tried to honor the vertical connection, the vertical dimension, but they um, they are a little bit uh, rhetorical for my taste. A little bit. But maybe necessary because uh, after so much horizontality, you need some verticality as well. But he, he can be overwhelming. I remember seeing a retrospective of his works at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, it's true, at that time I was uh, very, very weak for various reasons. But I remember I, I left the museum um, uh, dwarfed. He was not afraid to take risks. I mean, here is an older man who was not old at all. Maybe Le Corbusier was right. The problem in life is not to remain young, but to become young. In that sense, Frank Lloyd Wright became young. But he was always young. I mean, you know, even by today's standards, this building still looks uh, refreshing and new and engaging and exciting. So maybe I, I'm not sure I have to double check. Maybe this building doesn't have any kind of uh, commercial uh, activities. The Marin County Civic Center. No, so it doesn't. It's just a governmental building. I was wrong uh, previously. The structures were planned to melt into the sunburned hills. 
be they, I don't know, but that's what he wanted. The structures were planned to melt into the sunburned hills. Do they re really, do they really melt? But the building is still has the distinction of architecture as opposed to other buildings around it. Robert Walton House, 1957. Wellman House, 1974. 1974, he was dead at that time. Something is wrong, or maybe it was built then. A little hard to, to, to see in this picture, sorry. That's it. So this was Frank Lloyd Wright in California. Thank you for being here today.